A few years ago, I came across the start of one of Miss Naylor's series, The Boys Start the War, the first book in the boy-girl battle, was perhaps one of the funniest books I'd ever read. Within the few words was a secret bottle of laughter. As jokes and pranks and trouble were going on in this little fictional world, I simply could not stop giggling. Since then, I have completed the entire series. No matter what was going on in reality, somehow or other, this series had a way of using a magical sort of hilarity to coat everything in humor. Every time I picked up one of Miss Naylor's books, I simply could not put it down until I finished. Some books are always there for you. Ever since second grade, I could always dive right into the Alice series. The books would always give me a good laugh, yet at the same time, I would really invest myself into Alice's problems. Lovable characters in perplexing situations is what made the Alice series so charming and addicting. But the wonderful writing doesn't just stop there. Shiloh is another beloved book that won the John Newberry Medal and the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Book Award. In fact, you can read about the journey to writing so, ma so many cherished stories in How I Came to Be a Writer, which won the Golden Kite Award for nonfiction. While Miss Naylor is a fantastic author, she's also a person. Her favorite color is green. She loves chocolate. She enjoys baking and, believe it or not, snorkeling. She's with us today so we can learn more about her as a person. Please, Please help, help us in welcoming Miss Phyllis Reynolds Naylor. Thank you for that super charming introduction. Can you all hear me? Am I okay? Um, you're sort of blind to me because of the light, but I know you're out there, so I'll just begin. It's wonderful to be back at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. I spoke here once before. It's the place that the Washington Post calls a charming picnic kind of place, and it really is. About 30 years ago, I got the idea to write a single book, The Agony of Alice, about a motherless girl and all the embarrassing things that can happen to her as she's being raised by her dad and her older brother. She's looking for a role model and finds it, not in the most beautiful teacher in sixth grade, but the homeliest. And that was really all I intended to do with this book. And then the letters started coming and reviewers said things like, Alice's many fans will await her further adventures. And I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> A couple of years went by, and I discussed the possibility of a series with my editor, and I finally agreed to try it, provided I wouldn't have to write more than one book a year, and that in each book, Alice could grow a little older. I didn't want to be stuck in a sitcom and turning out books like pancakes. For the next 27 years, I spent the first six, of, first six months of every year writing another Alice book, and then the next six months writing something else, Shiloh, or The Boys Start the War, or Faith, Hope, and Ivy June. And every April or May, a new Alice novel would hit the bookstores. As Alice leaves grade school and enters middle school, and then high school, her body and her emotions change along with her. And I soon realized that very young girls were reading their older sister's books and the mothers were hiding the copies. So I wrote three Alice prequels to slow them down a little bit. At some point, I decided that I really ought to know how far I was going to take this girl. And at first I thought that the series would end when she graduated from high school. I think I even said that in, in an interview. And then I began getting worried letters from fans saying, in effect, Dear Mrs. Naylor, we realize that you are getting elderly. <laughs> <laughs> and if something happened to you, how would we ever know if Alice married Patrick or if Elizabeth and Pamela stayed friends? And we absolutely have to know what happens to Lester. So I jumped about seven books ahead and wrote what I figured would be a draft of the final book. I titled it Always Alice and put it in a fireproof box in my office with a note to my son saying, Dear Mike and Jeff, if anything happens to me before I finish the Alice series, send this manuscript to Simon & Schuster and they'll know what to do about it. 
Then I went back to writing one Alice book a year. But what I hadn't realized was that I was writing not just about a girl and her closest friends, but about a family, a neighborhood, a community of people. And I found I needed to remember every darn detail in every single person's life from book to book. The first names of friends' parents, Halloween costumes, the girls' physical descriptions, the talents, the phobias. I had to be able to recall every Christmas celebration, vacation, the make of the family car, a boyfriend's cars, allergies, anniversaries, doctors, dentists. We soon discovered that Alice had been, been given three different birth dates in May. <laughs> that Elizabeth had pierced ears in one book, but not the next. That a minor character said to have been chubby all of her life was pencil thin in another. I couldn't remember if Pamela had sisters and brothers or whether Alice lost her mother when she was in kindergarten or preschool. And readers took such delight in finding mistakes that we were almost tempted to add a few. But then the publisher asked a brave copy editor to produce an Alice Bible, as they called it. And finally, I had the most wonderful handbook. It was revised every few years. It's about 100 pages long listing everything you would ever want to know about any character with the page numbers included. A brief synopsis of each book as well as all the inconsistencies that weren't caught in time. And this document is available on the Alice McKinley website and anybody can look that up. It seems to me that Alice's whole life can be written in the embarrassing things that happened to her. She remembers how in kindergarten, for example, she used to eat crayons. I didn't just eat them either, she says. One day when I was bored, I stuck two crayons up my nostrils, <laughs> then leaned over my desk and wagged my head from side to side like an elephant with tusks. And the teacher said, Alice McKinley, what on earth are you doing? Well, that really happened to me. When I was in third grade, I saw a boy do it. And I remember saying to myself, Phyllis, you are now looking at the stupidest thing you will ever see in your life, and you should remember it always, and so I have. Much of the time, however, Alice is an embarrassment to her older brother, especially in her early years when Lester, who is seven years older than she is, is a teenager. And because she has no mother, and Alice feels secure in her dad-brother relationship, she often brings up questions of life and love at the dinner table. When Alice is in fifth grade, for example, she's invited to a sleepover with her girlfriends, and behind the closed door of their bedroom, the girls are devouring a little book about menstruation. This starts a discussion about having babies, specifically how they get inside the mother in the first place. The girls think they know, but they're not quite sure. And then Megan asked the question that all of us were wondering about. When there is sperm inside you to make a baby, how does it get in there? For a minute, nobody said anything. We just looked embarrassed because we had some idea of what happened between a man and a woman, but none of us knew exactly. I think the father squirts it up there, I said finally, which was about all I knew about sex. How, asked Jody, joking, with a spray bottle? We all howled then so hard that we rolled off the bed laughing. When we climbed back on again, Rosalind said, I think he puts it up there with his penis. Megan clapped one hand over Rosalind's mouth as though she'd said a bad word, and then Don reached up and turned off the light. It was easier talking in the dark. He does not, said Megan. My folks would never do that. <laughs> how then, I ask. The woman goes to the doctor, that's how, said Megan. The doctor puts his penis in her, I ask. <laughs> no, Megan cried, and we all shrieked again. It's like Alice said, Rosalind explained. Dogs do it, cats do it, elephants do it. Well, people don't, it's gross, said Megan. We lay there in the dark thinking. Let's ask somebody, said Jody. Who's going to ask, said Dawn. 
Alice, said Rosalind. Alice will find out the answer and tell us at recess. The next night at dinner, Alice remembers what she's supposed to ask, but she doesn't want her dad or her 19-year-old brother thinking she doesn't know anything. I know all about sex, I began. I saw Lester roll his eyes. Dad looked up. What? I mean, you don't have to start at the beginning, I said. You don't have to tell me everything. That's good, said Lester, because I sort of wanted to talk about basketball. I ignored him. <clears throat> I know that it takes a man and a woman to make a baby, but I don't know exactly how the man gets his sperm inside the woman, I said. With a glue gun, said Lester, <laughs> and took a bite of cornbread. Less, said Dad, and then he cleared his throat. I don't know why it is that I can't get a simple answer to a simple question without a lot of throat clearing and the whole story of the human race. When a man and woman want to start a family, Dad began. Please don't start with buying a house, I said. <laughs> yeah, Dad, cut to the chase, said Lester. So Dad speeded it up. People who love each other want to get their bodies as close together as possible. And when that happens, the man puts his penis inside the woman's vagina. And out comes the sperm, I ask. Something like that, said Dad. Like pee, I ask. Not that much, said Dad. For crying out loud, I'm eating, Lester complained. <laughs> Sounds messy to me, I said. I thought about it a minute. Where do they do it, in the bathtub, over the toilet? Lester bolted back in his chair. I don't believe this, he said. Then he hunched over his plate again. They do it out in the backyard, Al, and hose themselves down afterwards. <laughs> Lester, Dad said, she's asking some basic questions here. They do it in bed, Alice. People make love in bed. Those are the exact same questions I asked my mother when I was nine, and those are the exact same questions she asked, uh, answers she gave me. What I hear most from fans is the comment, Alice is so real. I wanted her to be an ordinary girl whom almost anyone could identify with. She's not the all-American girl or the ideal teenager. She's simply one girl whom I decided to follow through life from third grade to age 60. And the question I asked myself continually as I wrote this series was, what would Alice do? I felt as though I should be wearing a bracelet with WWAD on it. <laughs> Most of what happens to her is from my own imagination, but I mixed in things that happened to me and my friends as well. In fact, when she's a freshman in high school, and falls down the stairs on her first day, wetting her pants, I'm simply recreating what happened to my own mother back in 1914 on her first day of high school. Situations may change, but feelings are the same from generation to generation. She asked her dad once what it was like when her mom died of leukemia, because she remembers so little of it, and misty-eyed, he describes the last weeks of her life and how he was there when she died, stroking her hair. I think I remember going to see her once, Alice says. Did I visit her in the hospital? Yes, they wheeled her down to the sunroom, they called it. I brought you in and you were frightened at first because of the IV hookup, all the tubes. But when I sat you on her lap, I remember that. And I remember that she smelled different. I didn't think it was her at first because her legs were so bony. I could feel tears welling up in my own eyes. Then she put her lips against my ear and hummed my favorite song. And I knew it was her. And we snuggled. I swallowed. And I cried when I had to leave. So did she, Al, her dad says. And so did I. Not only is Alice looking for a role model for herself, but she's looking for a woman that her dad could marry. And when she reaches middle school, she thinks she's found her, 
Sylvia Summers, her seventh grade English teacher, who happens to be in an on-again, off-again relationship with their vice principal. When she finds out that Sylvia likes classical music, she just knows that her dad, manager of a music store, is the man for her. And yes, I had that Silver Springs store, Dale Music, in mind when I wrote this. Alice somehow manages to get an extra ticket to the Messiah sing-along that she attends every year with her dad. She invites Miss Summers, who agrees to go, thinking that it's a family thing. And when Ben McKinley pulls up to her house, only finding out that day that Alice invited a friend, he's getting exasperated with her when she insists that he go to the door and get her, finally confessing it's not just a friend, it's a teacher. Alice McKinley, you are the limit, he says, assuming the woman is elderly and needs help. But he opens the car door and sprints up the stairs. Then Sylvia Summers steps out on the porch in her bright blue coat and high heels, and he's as stunned as she is. As the evening progresses, it's obvious to both of them that this is a put-up job. They do enjoy the concert in each other's company, though, and afterwards they drive through the grounds of the Mormon temple to see all the lights, just to prolong the evening, Alice happily sitting in the back seat, of course. But after Ben escorts Sylvia back to her door, he comes down the steps, gets in the car, turns to the back seat and says, get up front, Al. She does. Don't the Mormons have nice lights, she chirps. Al, I really like the concert, Dad. Al, I shut up. Don't you ever do that again, he tells her. My heart sank. I I thought we all had a good time. You thought I would fall in love and marry your teacher and you'd have a mother, that's what you thought. Well, things don't work that way, Al. But you had a nice time. I did, and so did she. I know it. You don't know the first thing about love, Al, and she's too young for me, her dad says. They argue all the way home and finally he says, I don't want you doing anything, anything to get us together again. If we see each other some other time, that's up to us, not you. Is that strictly understood? Yes, I said in a voice I could hardly hear. No hints, no suggestions, no nothing. I mean it. This woman or any other. Okay, I said softly. But two blocks from their house, Alice realizes that her dad is whistling softly under his breath something from the Messiah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Several years later, and many books later, Ben and Sylvia do marry. But meanwhile, Alice and her friends have to figure out a number of things for themselves. The summer before eighth grade, Alice, Elizabeth, and Pamela take a train to visit Alice's Aunt Sally in Chicago. Liz and Alice in one small roomette, and Pamela, looking and dressing far older than her age, in another. She attracts the attention of a man who, thinking that she's traveling alone, invites her to dinner. In the dining car, Pamela has a blast, pretending she's 18. That night, however, she hides out with the other two girls in their compartment because he's made a pass at her, and Pamela doesn't want to carry this any further. Finally, she tells them exactly what happened. The man kissed her and touched her breast just before she got away. Elizabeth sat down slowly, her shoes in her hand. Both breasts, she asked. No, just one. Just like that, he just reached out and touched your breast? No, he was kissing me, trying to anyway. Elizabeth's eyes traveled down Pamela's face and fastened on her breasts. Which one was it? For heaven's sake, Elizabeth, what does it matter, I said. It matters. Pamela, you ought to go to church with me and have it blessed or something. <laughs> blessed, I cried. Made whole again, she said uncertainly. It is whole, I protested. He didn't take a bite out of it or anything. <laughs> Just the same, I'd feel better if you went to church with me and talked to a priest about it. 
I'd feel better if I never had to see that man again, Pamela said. Well, once Ben McKinley marries Sylvia Summers, Alice, her older self now, discovers that she doesn't love this woman as much as she thought she would because they don't agree about everything. Alice gets her driver's license with the understanding that she can't have friends in the car with her until she has been driving six months without an accident. Now the six months are up. Alice is so certain that her parents recognize the importance of this particular day that she hasn't even let them know of her plans to drive her friends to a club in Georgetown to celebrate. Her dad is at a conference in Baltimore and when Sylvia mentions that she, is, that she needs her car that night to drive a handicapped friend somewhere, Alice is furious and they have sharp words for each other. Later, sullenly, when she knows she's defeated, Alice asks Sylvia not to tell her dad that they quarreled, knowing how disappointed he would be in her. Sylvia says she won't, but Alice isn't sure that she believes her. And later, when her dad comes home from Baltimore and is turning out the lights, Alice goes upstairs first and on a wild impulse, hides in the blanket closet of their bedroom to listen in. It takes her only seconds to realize what a stupid, rude, horrific thing she is doing, but it's too late. They enter the bedroom and Alice discovers they are going to make love. She can't believe what she has done, and it's impossible to suddenly emerge from their closet. She covers her ears and curls into a ball. Later, she's able to crawl out into her own bedroom, but when she hears Lester come in, opening and closing the refrigerator, she rushes downstairs and throws herself into the kitchen. Lester, I whispered, holding onto the edge of the table, I've done an awful, terrible thing. He was holding a glass in one hand, orange juice container in the other. Are the police on the way? He asked. Listen to me, I gulped. I just, I just, something about my face, the flush of it perhaps, caught his attention, and he puts the orange juice on the counter. What's wrong, he asked. Are you sick? It came out in breathy spurts. I was mad at Sylvia and wanted to see if she'd tell Dad what I'd said to her, and I... I hid in their closet, and they just had sex. Lester put down the glass. You what? He said, disbelieving. It's awful. I know. I didn't realize they were going to do it. I wanted to hear what she told him after promising me she wouldn't, and she didn't tell him they made love instead, and I heard. Lester kept staring at me, shaking his head. I can't believe you did that, he said. I can't either, I wept. How am I going to tell Dad? What? I've got to apologize and he'll be furious, I continued. No, said Les. What? You don't have to tell him and you shouldn't. Why, Lester, it's a terrible thing I did. I'll never feel right again if... Al, listen to me. Lester came over, took me by the shoulders and sat me down in a chair. For once you've got to be an adult. You're never going to mention this to either Dad or Sylvia. This is something you've got to keep to yourself. I just stared at him. I'll never be able to face them again. Every time I look at them, I'll remember and... And you won't say one word, Lester said sternly. I, I've never kept big things from Dad before I cried. I have to know he forgives me. This is going to be one of the most grown-up things you'll ever have to do, Al, said Lester, but you've got to deal with this yourself. You've got to save Dad and Sylvia the embarrassment of noticing that you were listening to something very, very private. It's not like they were in the next room and you couldn't help but overhear. I shook my head. I'll never feel good about myself again if I have to keep this all bottled up, I cried. Yes, you will, because you'll be a better person knowing how absolutely wrong you were tonight. If I thought it would be hard to tell Dad what I'd done, somehow it seemed a lot harder not to confess, and suddenly I wished I were Catholic. If I were Catholic, I could go to a priest and tell him what I'd done, and at least he would tell me how many Hail Marys it would take to be forgiven. I, at least I think that's how it works. Lester, I said plaintively, pretend you're a priest. What? 
I want someone to tell me I'm forgiven. You're forgiven. You're not God. Then pray to God. I sank back in the chair, arms dangling at my sides. What makes me do stuff like this less? He was rummaging through the refrigerator again and pulled out a slice of pound cake. I don't know, he said. Mix up chromosomes or something. Anyone saving this pound cake? You can have it, I said. What's wrong with the shrimp salad? Can I have it? You can have that too, I said. And as Lester began to eat, none of this would have happened if you'd been home this evening and agreed to drive five girls to Edgar's in Georgetown. If I'd been crazy enough to drive five girls to Georgetown, I'd be the, mixed, the one with mixed up chromosomes, said Les. I got some graham crackers and drank some milk. Where were you tonight anyway, I asked. At a movie, but if I'd known you were upstairs hiding in a closet, I would have come earlier and dragged you out. I guess you're right about never telling them, I said. I'm glad you're here, Les. It's always good to talk about things with someone. I put my glass in the sink, and as I started for the stairs, I heard Les say, go, my child, and sin no more. <laughs> and I smiled for the first time that evening. This was a scene that my editor did not want in the book. And she said that she had shown it to all of the other people in the office, and they all said, I should not put that scene in the book. But I insisted because it represents a life-changing moment for Alice, wrenching as it is. And all those women in the office are decades younger than I am. And I said, what's the matter with you people? I'm a lot older than you are. But, because, but it's a moment when Alice discovers that she absolutely cannot share something with her beloved father. And the, fa the, the thought of this is almost debilitating for her. But she has to learn that growing up sometimes means being able to forgive yourself. And through it, she becomes a better person. Perhaps her ultimate experience, however, happens in the book, Intensely Alice, when one of her friends has, she's grown up with is killed in a traffic accident. He was just sitting in his car at the light and was rear-ended by a truck. Alice and her close-knit group of friends are beside themselves with grief. It's the injustice, the unfairness of life that overwhelms them. He was just sitting there, Alice weeps, and goes on to say, it doesn't make any sense to believe in a God watching over us when he lets things like this happen. For days, she stays holed up alone in her room, not wanting to talk. Then finally, one night, she comes out and tells her dad, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I don't even know if I believe there's a God. If someone asked me what religion I was, I'd probably say I'm still finding out. All I know is I want to be part of everything that's good and true and real. And that's sort of what's happening with me, in case you're interested. And her dad pats the cushion beside him, welcoming her over. That's a good place to begin, he says. When this book came out, I had letter after letter from weeping readers, and I knew just how they felt because I cried when I wrote that chapter. Of course, I knew it was going to be Mark many books in advance, having followed him in the story since he was in third grade too. And to many readers who started at the beginning of the series, they felt they had grown up with this group of friends, and it was as though one of their own had died. So once I had written the 27 Alice books and the 28th was ready to go to be written, I took out that old draft, and I wondered what to rewrite, what to say. All along, readers had been sending me suggestions. Have her marry. Don't marry. Please, please have her marry Patrick. Do not let her marry Patrick. She should live abroad. She should join a commune, have an abortion, get a dog. I really had to let the character lead me, to stay in Alice's skin and remain that ordinary girl whom readers could easily identify with, who makes mistakes but sometimes does or says exactly the right thing, who has highs and lows in her life, and friends who want to be part of it. And by the time I had finished, I had changed a lot, even the title, and always Alice became, now I'll tell you everything, which I do in the book. As readers will discover, becoming a woman doesn't mean that Alice still doesn't find herself in embarrassing situations, 
from trapping herself in a porta john to ending up on her back in a rowboat. I do miss this girl, and it's hard to say goodbye. Writing the dialogue between Alice and Lester was one of my most favorite things to do, and I think of her more often than I had expected I would. In fact, at a dinner in New York with my editor, for example, we had entered a popular restaurant where a number of editors hang out, and I recognized a number from Simon & Schuster. Our table, however, was up a grand staircase to the mezzanine, and I was wearing clogs. And halfway up, one of my shoes fell off, and I momentarily lost my balance and sat down. Instantly, a couple men on the first floor leaped up from their chairs and came rushing to help me, and all I could do was tell them I was fine, I was just having an Alice moment. <laughs> Readers often tell me their most favorite Alice moment. One girl said she was just fooling around with a vitamin pill, stuck it up her nose, and then she couldn't get it out. All day, she wrote, I dripped purple snot. <laughs> I get lots of questions, too. Some are easy to answer, some not. One of them was, is it normal to have hair growing under only one armpit? <laughs> we exchange worlds, these readers and I. I give them Alice, and they give me a glimpse into their own lives. I love all the Alice books and have been reading them since I was about eight, one girl wrote me. I go to a private school and a few years ago they took them out of our library. I was so mad because the Alice books relate to all the problems girls have. I was sincerely grateful for them when I got my period at nine years old. And from another I just want to know when you were going to have Alice lose her virginity, when she is going to get married and pregnant and stuff like that. My mom said girls shouldn't lose their virginity until they get married, but I told her, whatever. When did you lose your virginity? <laughs> I'm going to close with this from a 20-something woman in Canada. I've spoken so often of how the Alice series shaped me that my boyfriend surprised me with all the books I need to complete my collection. I've read the first two already and have been laughing and crying out loud. I was raised near a library and the Alice books were my beacon. It's such a joy to always have Alice to visit nearby on the shelf and I really like the way I turned out as a woman. Thank you. And I think that that's been my great joy, hearing that the Alice books have made girls feel good about themselves and the way that they're turning out. And now I think we have about 10 minutes left for questions. And I'm supposed to tell you that, well, I'll let you tell them about the books there. Oh, okay. Um, Ms. Naylor has free copies of her book on writing. Um, those are back on the back table, so as you exit the tent, you're welcome to take a copy with you. So do we have any questions? Are you um, planning on um, doing, I mean, bringing out a new Alice book anytime soon? No, that's the end. There are too many books I want to write, and I really think I've said everything that I wanted to say about Alice. Somebody said, are you going to write a book about her dying? Well, she would have to be writing it herself, right? I mean, they're all in first person, and I don't think that would be a bestseller. For <laughs> if you were to write in the perspective of any other character, which would you choose? You know, I've been asked, why don't I write a series about Patricia? Why don't I write one about um, Elizabeth? And I really like Lester. I think I would write one at Lester as he's a teen. He, he's, he's really fun. I love Lester. If, if you had to ask what is my favorite character, it's, it's Lester. I'm interested in the... Can't hear you. I'm interested in the uh, sales of your book as a function of there being a continuous series versus if you had written individual books about different people over time. What did Simon Schuster tell you about the benefits of writing a series of the same person? 
Um, when I, they were all for the series, but a bookseller said to me, keep her in the same age. If you have her grow older, you're going to use lose your readers. And I thought, well, then I'll lose my readers, but why not have them grow along with me? Even though I wrote three, three books for every year of her life, and they only came out once a year. So readers grew older much faster than Alice. But many times, um, I heard from so many girls that they just stopped at a certain point, And then they went back to the bookstore, and here were a whole bunch of books and Alice was now up to their age. So they move them up. But if I wrote all the books when she's in the same grade, the same situation, that would be so boring. I just, I can't imagine doing that. But I also wanted to take her to 60 because to some girls, 60 is the end of life. <laughs> and, and, and for Alice, she's starting off on a whole new thing if you read the book when she's 60. Life is just beginning again in a whole new way. And I really wanted to do that, so I took her that far. Would you tell us about your writing process? Do you outline your novels? Do you stare out the window? Do you usually write in the morning or at night? Or what, what's your writing process like? When I'm, I'm always thinking about books. Ideas come at me like bees, and I'm just swatting them away because the book that you're working on is really the one you want to put your heart in and you don't want these others to interfere. But <clears throat> when I can't get rid of an idea, I write down just a synopsis of it, just a one-page synopsis, <coughs> no, no outlines, um, telling how it begins, how it ends, what the climax is, and a few big things happening along the way. And then I put that notebook aside with masking tape on the binding, saying, saying the cover, saying the, what the title will be. For some reason, I can't write until I know what the title will be. And um, then when I actually start writing, I uh, sit in a most comfortable chair with a clipboard on my lap, and I write in longhand, and I write the whole first chapter twice or three times. It used to be three times in longhand. Now my hand is giving out. And uh, so I do, and at, after the second draft, I put it on the computer, print it out, change it, print it out, change it seven, eight times before I'm really happy with it. Is that, was that exactly what you were asking? Mm. Hi. Um, I was a very big fan of your Shiloh books mm -hmm. and wondered how the transition from an active boy's mind um, you know, and in an adventure type of uh, activity level, how the transition to going to a quiet book like Alice felt for you? Yeah. Was it easy to separate characters and time? And, and Not really. Um, I write all kinds of books, gothic, um, uh, mystery, suspense, humor, a lot of humor. Um, I grew up with a brother. I have two sons, so I know it, it's, it's easy for me to do that. Um, some things are hard for me. What's very hard for me is description, um, describing how somebody's sitting. And I should be able to do that, but I don't. Um, describing faces. My, my sons know that my favorite book to get at Christmas are books of just faces of people in Appalachia or people in New York. And so when I want to describe a character, I go through one of these books and I put paper clips and say, this is going to be the dad, this is going to be the mother, and then I have to turn back and say, she had a pointy chin or whatever. I can't seem to see that, and I wish, I wish that I could. But description is just hard for me. Go ahead. So you follow Alice through, I mean, decades and decades and decades of her life. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but at a certain point you were writing the prequels, but also writing the high school books. So how did you in your mind kind of switch between, okay, this is Alice at eight versus this is Alice at 16? Because I mean, that's, it's the same person, but I mean, you go through such huge it, changes. For three years, I was writing the regular Alice book and a prequel to, um, I don't know, it just, that's, that's not hard for me. <laughs> uh, 
I know you're writing another Shiloh book. Have you finished that yet? I have finished it, and the cover is glorious. I just saw it the other day. The final Shiloh book is going to come out in September. It's called A Shiloh Christmas, and it will end the Shiloh series. There will be a quartet. Um, it's, it's um, I don't know if I should say it's my favorite or not, but uh, I think it ties up a lot of things in the, in the series, and it's hard for me to... There is West Virginia in my blood simply because I married a man from West Virginia, and the whole boy-girl um, series that someone was talking about in the introduction is, um, takes place in Buckman, West Virginia, which is really Buchanan, West Virginia, where my husband grew up, and I had a map of the town and when I, when I wrote that book, so that, that helped. But um, I forget what question I was on. Am I just babbling or answering a question? <laughs> This may be a very hard question, but what's, the favorite, what's your favorite book you've ever written? Probably it's an adult novel called Unexpected Pleasures, and it's about a bridge builder building the second Chesapeake Bay Bridge who takes a 16-year-old girl under his wing. She's destined for the uh, juvenile home, and I don't know what, when this took place, the 1950s, 40s, and the people in the community say, oh no, a bachelor can't take a girl into his home unless he marries her. So he proposes. She says, whatever, more or less. And I, I care for this girl. She's the son of the, she's the daughter of the town drunk. And he's shy, he's a shy bachelor. And just the way they finally relate, they have so much trouble relating, I'm just pulling for them. But I love that book. And um, it was going to be made into a movie, and the, the people came out and looked for the town and uh, it, the um, place in Charles County. But that's happened with a number of my movies, that Sally Field bought one, and she was going to star in it, and then she broke up with Bert, and then uh, <laughs> things happen. So when somebody says they're interested in making a movie of your book, you just nod and say, that's nice, and then you hope you live long enough to see it on the screen. Hello. Uh, I have published a few books in a book club called fanstory.com. I, I run into one problem. I, almost all my books are written in an American scenario. I run into a trouble where I want to reproduce slangs. I can't find any source, a character who speaks in the slang, because you know English is spoken in 500 different ways. Uh, do, you, do you have any suggestion where I can do something to get authentic slangs for uh, a, to make a character more vivid. Are you talking about present day slang? Well, yeah, someone like a character, like a housemaid, uh, talking from West Virginia, for example. And if she has to, I had to use a West Virginia slang as against New York or uh, uh, Texas, they yeah, change. I I think maybe you're talking about dialect, a, a lot of the, the whole, um, I don't know except to go there and be there. I know that there is, years ago I bought a book called Dictionary of Slang, but by the time you buy it, it's probably out of date, it changes so much. Google would be my, the first place I would go, um, but you really have to, if you're really writing a whole novel and, and using the dialect of of a group that you don't know well, um, you should you should go there and you should really take a lot of notes and live it. Yeah. You did. I wish you luck with that. <laughs> I think we have a few more minutes, do we? I've read that the Harry Potter books went through 40 rejections before mm. they reached publication. Talk about your first book. Did you ever have rejection before success? Actually, um, I started writing at a very wonderful time. It was the 1960s when there was Title I and Title II, and, 
and everybody wanted, libraries wanted more books, more books, because they had the money to buy more, so it was easier to get a first book published. But I was scared to do it. And so I had written for the denominational church magazines, not anything religious, but character building for years. And many of them took place in foreign countries. So I thought, well, I'll just take nine short stories that I like the most, each one taking place in a different country, and I'll send it to, say, the Methodist Church Publishing House, Abington Press, because they have missionaries, so they might be interested in stories that take place. In, and they bought it right off. And then um, I wrote a humor column for teens for years and years and years. So I put those columns in a book and sold it to a Lutheran place. And I thought, hey, this is, this is not bad. But when I got, then I read that the Follett Company was offering a prize for the first novel. So I wrote a book called um, What the Gulls Were Singing about a family that goes to the ocean every year. And I put everything in that book from buried treasure to shipwrecks to everything and submitted it. And it, they didn't take it. They didn't win the prize. They sent it back to me. And they said, we'll read this again if you completely rewrite it from the viewpoint of one character. So I reviewed it. I rewrote it from the viewpoint of the girl in the story and sent it back. And they published it. And it's what the gulls were singing. And I don't think it sold very many copies, but it was my start. And that made me pretty happy. So um, as she said, I have, there are tons more of those books. Take some for your neighbors. Um, it was a book that um, the Writer Magazine asked me to write years ago. And when they ran out of them and didn't publish anymore, I, I had them published. And I want more space in my apartment, so I'm giving them to, <laughs> to Gaithersburg. So help yourself back there. And I guess I'll see you at book signings.